Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning to everyone. So, uh, I am Marzia Binti Muhammad, a chemistry lecturer at College Matriculasi Melaka. Today, I would like to share my student's project for this semester. The project uh, title is the Virtual Chemistry Fest 2021. So, the project is presented by six practical class, which is as 13T5, 13T11, S31, T8, S13, T6, S31, T3 and S13, T12. They will present a project that related to chemistry to show that how they able to relate the chemistry with a daily life um, experience. All right. So the main objective of this project is to help my students to link and relate what they already learned in chemistry with the real life situation. Besides that, I also hope that this project will improve my student confidence level, creativity, digital skill, especially in the way they edit the video and cinematography, leadership skill, digital literacy, and also emotional and their social skills. All of these skills are very important nowadays since we are in a VUCA situation. So uh, without further ado, I hope that you all enjoy the show and gain benefit from this project. So uh, as a beginning, so let's invite the first group to present. So the moderator for this group is Alia and Gan Bi Chong. Okay, Alia. Are you there? Ah uh, yes, my dear. Uh, all right. So uh, Alia and Bichong will introduce their project, and after that, they will play a video that relate to their project. So, uh, so you can select Alia. All right. Assalamualaikum and good morning, everyone. We are from S one three P five, and we would like to present about saponification. It is a process that involves the conversion of fat, oil, or lipid into soap and alcohol by the action of heat in the presence of aqueous alkali. It also can be defined as a hydrogen reaction when free hydroxide break the ether bond between the fatty acid and the glycerol of a triglyceride, resulting in the free fatty acids and glycerol, which are each soluble in aqueous solution. Salts are salts of fatty acids, and fatty acids are monomers of lipids that have the long carbon chain. The saponification reaction occurs between acid and base. In this experiment, we use sodium chloride and palm oil to produce soap. Bar. Hence, the product of the reaction are glycerol and Crude soap. Next, we will show about the pro we will show a video about how to product a soap to the saponification process. The apparatus and chemical reagents that we need for this experiment are measuring cylinder, filter funnel, and filter paper, beaker, glass rod, spatula, tripod stand, wire gauze. Bunsen burner, coconut oil, distilled water, solid sodium chloride, and solid sodium hydroxide. The first step for this experiment is freeze approximately 15 gram of sodium hydroxide. And 15 gram of sodium chloride. Measure 60 ml of coconut oil. Prepare a sodium chloride solution by mixing 15 gram solid sodium chloride with 200 ml of distilled water. Prepare a sodium hydroxide solution by mixing 15 gram solid sodium hydroxide with 50 ml of distilled water. It is observed that the beaker is warm. This shows that it undergoes exothermic reaction. 
add the sodium hydroxide solution with 60ml coconut oil. Stir while adding. Heat the mixture for 12 minutes. Stir it continuously while heating. Add sodium chloride solution slowly to the mixture and stir it continuously. Left aside for 30 to 40 minutes. Filter the mixture. After the filtration, soap is left on the filter paper. Okay, right. So, congratulations to group one, which is uh, the, the first presenter, which is S132, uh, 13T5. Right. So, we will have another show from S13T11. So, so, let's invite Aida and Hanis to the broadcast. All right. So, Aida and Hanis, let's introduce your project. And after that, uh, we will play the video that you already prepared. Okay. Assalamualaikum and good morning to Madam and to all of the classes that are watching right now. Uh, okay, firstly, I just want to say thank you to Madam for this opportunity to participate in this campus. It was an experience for all of us. Me, Aida Iziani, and I, Farah Hanis, will be today's moderator for our class as 13P11. So our topic that we choose today is about diet. Without further ado, let's watch the slide that we have prepared for you guys. Hi everyone, let's start off with this question. What is organic chemistry? It is the study of the structure, properties, composition, reactions, and preparation of carbon-containing compounds. Organic means derived from living things, and the term organic chemistry was coined by the Swedish chemist Jan Jacob Berzelius, who discovered several elements and came up with the modern chemical symbols that we use today. Can you imagine a world without colors? Colorless rainbows, no purple lollipops, no yellow flowers, no color at all. Luckily, this was a reality even our great 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 ancestors didn't have to face. Let me introduce you dyes. They are substances used to impart color to textiles, paper, leather, and other materials. Dyes differ from pigments, which are finely ground solids dispersed in a liquid. Dyes are organic compounds as they contain carbon. Color is directly related to the molecular structure of the dye. Next, let's talk about the dye structure and colors. Dyes contain sequences of conjugated double bonds, like this, where X is carbon, oxygen, or nitrogen. 
They contain conjugated systems of benzene rings bearing simple unsaturated groups which are chromophores and polar groups which are oxychromes. Here's the example of dyes. The colors of dyes are due to the absorption of visible lines by the compounds. Organic compounds absorb electromagnetic energy, but only those with cellular conjugated double bonds appear colored by the absorption of visible lines. History of dyes Natural dyes until the 1850s, virtually all dyes were obtained from natural sources, most commonly from vegetables such as plants, trees, and lichens, with a few from inside. Solid evidence that dye method of more than 4,000 years old has been provided by dyed fabric found in Egyptian tomb. Ancient hieroglyphs describe extraction and application of natural dyes. Countless attempts have been made to extract dyes from brightly colored plants and flowers. Yet, only a dozen or so natural dyes found widespread use. Undoubtedly, most attempts fail because most natural dyes are not highly stable and occur as component of complex mixtures. Decline natural dyes. Until 1857, the dyes industry utilized natural dyes almost exclusively. However, by 1900, nearly 90% of industrial dyes are real synthetic. Several factors contributed to the commercial decline of natural dyes. By 1850, the Industrial Revolution in Europe led to the burgeoning textile industry, which created increased demand for readily available, inexpensive and easily applied dyes and revealed the important economic limitation of natural dyes. Purple color. It provides a perfect insight into the history of fabric and dyes. Its position as a status symbol Roman emperors who often wear purple. It was sometimes even worth its own weight in gold. The purple color could only be achieved by crushing thousands of shells of a mollusk called murex, found on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean. It became the most expensive color to mix and still is. Fun fact. When Alexander the Great conquered Prussia, he saw clothes dyed with purple and liked it so much that it became the color associated with royalty. So here's an interesting fun fact for us. People used to dye fabrics with beautiful colors using organic plant materials like flowers and dirt with a little help from our own urine. Urea is the main nitrogen containing part of urine that comes from our body's metabolic breakdown of proteins. But it is also a great fabric dye, modern, which is a chemical that makes the dye last longer and often enhances the color. This is because urea can form a chemical bridge between the dye molecule and the fabric and it shields the dye from fading in ancient Rome. People would even sell their urine to dyers who make some money. So move on to the next slide which is hair dye. A great majority of the dyes used in hair colouring are known as oxidation hair dyes. So the first one, oxidation dyes, more prominent of the two groups are produced directly on the hair by oxidizing aromatic diamonds with an oxidizing agent. It is suitable Diamines have been referred as a primary ingredient and the oxidize, oxidizing agent as the locus. Okay, okay. Alright, so we already at the end of our session, but before that, we would like to say thank you so much to our beloved. Uh, Madam Marzia for letting us during this live session. Uh, so when Madam said she want us to experience this kind of learning method with the, which is, this is our first time right, doing this. This is very nervous, but at the same time, we feel very excited. So I think we did well. And also thank you to everyone who joined this live session and lent us your ears for these few minutes. So I hope we can meet again at 
another day, another time. And stay safe, everyone. Bye. All right. Okay. Thank you, uh, apa? Aida and Honey. So let's invite the third uh, presentation, which is from S31, which is module 3, 31T8. And the presenter is Yong Jun Ken. All right. So Jun Ken. And also, I think Aini Ken. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So Jun Ken and Aini, let's introduce your project. And after that, uh, we will play the video of your presentation. Okay. Okay. Uh. Okay. Okay. Ini boleh 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 cakap. Okay. Uh, good morning. We are from S three one T eight. I'm Yong Jun Ken, and this is my classmate Aini, also from same practicum. And today we are going to present the physical property of water and oil. Uh, Aini, you may start now. Uh, uh, uh madam, uh, I not not sure. I will share the video for you all. So, uh, we we'll produce uh, what is water? Water is a substance composed of the chemical elements hydrogen and oxygen and acetate in gaseous liquid. Did you guys hear my voice? Okay. So, um, uh, so what is water? Water is a substance composed of the chemical elements hydrogen and oxygen and existing in uh gas, uh gas. Uh, solid and liquid. Uh, it is a tasteless and odorless liquid at room temperature. It has the important ab ability to dissolve many other substances. So the next slide is what? What is oil? Oil is a non-polar chemical substance that is viscous liquid at ambient temperature. Oil have a high hydro high carbon and hydrogen content and are usually flammable and surface active. Most oils are unsaturated liquids that are liquid at room temperature. So what happened when oil and water mix together? When mixing the oil and water, neither substance changes and no new substance is formed. The oil is still oil and the water is still water. They retain their physical properties like melting point, uh, melting point boiling point, and color order and even density. So uh, for the next slide, uh, it will be presented by Ellen. Uh, so, I will introduce about lava lamp. Lava lamp is a decorative lamp which is invented in 1963 by British entrepreneur Edward Craven Walker, the founder of the lightning company Mathmos. The lamp consists of a bolus of a special color wax mixture inside a glass vessel, the remainder of which contains clear or translucent liquid. And why we use oil for the lava lamp experience is because that oil floats on top of water because it is less dense than water. And the food coloring has the same density as water, so it sinks through the oil and mixes with sodium bicarbonate. Now, what is the science behind the lava lamp? Uh, the reaction between sodium bicarbonate with the mixture of vinegar and food coloring produces a uh, carbon dioxide and a gas which you can see bubble up as soon as the vinegar droplets come in contact with the baking soda. And this is the chemical equation, as you can see. And the conclusion is that oil is less dense than water, and oil is uh, more dense than alcohol, but less dense than water. The oil 
the molecules that make up the oil are larger than those that make up water so they can you know, pack as tightly together as the water molecules can. Uh, they take up more space per unit area and they are less dense. As a result, they also usually have low solubility in water. They are easier to dissolve in non-polar organic solvents such as benzene. Thus, oil have high boiling point in water. Thank you. Today we are going to show you how to apply some of the basic properties uh, or the application on your daily lives and we are going to show you how to make a candle with this and all this here. Uh, then you may start now. First of all, finding a good jar is the first thing to do and then after that you can put anything you want such as accessories or anything that is non-harmful ingredients. First of all, you may put some limited amount of water and then add the pot, and then you put uh, like, uh, a little of oil. Then we put uh, a transparent slip cover on the top. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Stop right there. We're not gonna light the candle here, we're gonna light it in the dark. Let's see how it looks like. We are light, tell you the truth. Hi guys, today we're going to determine uh, about saturated or unsaturated hydrocarbons. First, we put water uh, into a tube cup. Hi guys, today we are going to conduct an experiment to check the physical properties of oil whether it's saturated or unsaturated hydrocarbon. So the things we need is a cup, food coloring, sodium bicarbonate, oil, glass jar, vinegar and also a spoon. Okay, so we start now. Okay, so first, we have to put a vinegar into a cup. Okay. And then, we have to put food coloring for 2 or 3 drops. So, we have to shake it well and it dissolves. So and then, you may continue. Okay, and then, after that, we take uh, a clear glass of jar. And then put one tablespoon of soda bicarbonate. And then oil.
uh, thank you so much for, for watching. And this is from us, S three one T A. Thank you. Okay, thank you and congratulations, congratulations, Ellen and their group members and your group members. So we will invite the next group, which is S one three T six. The presenter is Wei Chong and Shamil. All right, so I will add Shamil and Wei Chong into the screen. Okay, so Wei Chong and Shamil, can you introduce your project? Okay, uh, very good morning to all the viewers and especially Madam Mazia. And then, uh, first of all, we are very honored to be participate, uh, participated in this CAMFest 2021. So I'm Ong Wei Chong for the moderator of SPRS S13P6. And Shamil? Uh, hi. I'm also the, uh, the moderator for S13P6. My name is Shamil Hakimi. Um, uh, I kind of can't share my face cam, so uh, I probably will only, uh, which only will share his face. Sorry about that. Okay, it's okay. So, okay. Uh, without further okay. ado, uh, we will start our presentation now. Shamil. Yes. Okay, first of all, uh, today our topic is about chemi luminescence. Okay, so I think many of us will be in our daily lifestyle, we, are, we have been looking at uh, things that will glow brightly and it really fascinates us. So how does this, how does this process, uh, how does this process work? So, okay, so one of the process that makes things, things glow is chemi luminescence. So, Okay, what is chemi luminescence? So chemi indicates that it has something to do with chemicals and luminescence means that it gives off light. So the whole word chemi luminescence means that generating light via a chemical reaction. So I'll give you for, for, for an example. So like incandescent light bulb is just like a typical light bulb that we use in our house. So when an electric current passes through the filament, they will definitely have some resistance. So this metal filament that uh, have resistance on it will start to get hot. And when it gets hot, it will excite the electrons to a higher state of energy level. So as we learned during semester one of electron transitions, when an electron is excited, it will achieve to a higher energy level. So, but when it reached the high energy level, it will start to stabilize its, itself by uh, transition transit it to a ground state by and then the process is really, really releasing a type of energy which is called photon and this which happens the re releasing of light so uh, I think like almost similar to chemical luminescence and one is is fluorescence so what fluorescence is, is the emission of light by an object that has absorbed either electromagnetic radiation or some type of light. Okay. Um, basically, fluorescence is that when an object uh, absorbs uh, energy in like uh, invisible line spectrum, like ultraviolet, uh, infrared, infrared is 
visible or not visible i remember but the the i the objects uh, receive uh, absorb energy from invisible light spectrum and then it um, radiates the uh, energy back in form of light in a visible light spectrum uh, which we can see um, some example that we all, always see is the Florence uh, lamp that we usually see the white the, that radiates like white light and another uh, example is our highlighter um, the highlighter that we use actually will glow in the dark if we if the room is dark enough and so we can see the light uh, the pro, uh, the light that produced by the highlighter um, so we can see it in the dark okay so moving on to the next one okay which is a bit difference between chemiluminescence is uh phosphorescence so okay phosphorescence is also a process of uh, emitting light but okay what it uh, it actually is quite similar to fluorescence that what have Shamir said just now so okay what is the difference between phosphorescence and fluorescence first so okay uh, in the case for fluorescence uh, when it absorbs the light energy and it will re emit the light immediately but for the case of phosphorescence it will not immediately re emit it but it re emit it in a delay way uh, this is due to the reason of the forbidden energy state transition in quantum physics so uh, for those because it is a quite deep topic for those that are interested in this uh, this this particular topic uh, you may go to the quantum physics and search for forbidden energy state transition so okay moving on to the next point which is so when how it, how does this how does this happen because the transition in energy occurs gradually in certain compounds so the absorbed radiation will only emit light at the low intensity for several hours after the original excitation so the object will glow it was start started to glow and it will slowly fade out so it depends on the chemical compound so it will maybe last for a few hours in the dark room or maybe just a few minutes so okay so one of the example that we usually see in our daily life is like uh, the alarm clock with the with the clock hand that has the phosphorescence i think highlighter like that so when we are sleeping during the night so when we want to want to see what is the time now so we can see it even in the dark room so this is one of the one of the example and another example is our watch so we also can see the time see what is the time now for when during in a dark place lah. okay okay for the main topic which is chemiluminescence so um the the special things about chemiluminescence between uh between the phosphorescence and fluorescence is chemiluminescence actually involve chemical reaction so how does it work when chem uh, a chemical reaction happens and then it generates a unstable compound like we have studied before in chemistry when something is uh, uh, in a uh, unstable uh, when an unstable compound it will become an it's in excited states right so it has to uh, stabilize itself um so how does it stabilize itself it has to um radiates in energy like decays or something like that to in order to go back to the ground state so in chemical medicine, when this this the compound is unstable it radiates uh, it radiates energy in photons uh so the photons that will emit the light uh, for the photons is the thing that will make the compounds become glow in the dark uh fun fact uh um some creature like some organism can actually do chemiluminescence itself but we don't call chemilumin uh we don't call it chemiluminescence we call it as a bioluminescence and some of the uh, organism that can do it is firefly and jellyfish as for firefly there's uh, this special protein that is it, have is the uh, luciferin uh, and then oh. for the part of jellyfish uh, 
it has another particular protein lah. It's called echorine, which is found in certain jellyfish, and it produces blue light in the presence of calcium. So in this video, uh, we have uh, explained the chemicals. Uh, so the left beaker is hydrogen peroxide and the right beaker which is blue color is luminol. Okay, uh, oh. Oh. All right. you can proceed. You can proceed. Oh. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes. Yes. Okay, oh, sorry. Fantastic. Okay, sorry about the disconnection. Okay, so one of the one of the most common way to show chemiluminescence in the laboratory, uh, laboratory is luminal reaction. So what is luminal reaction? Uh, it's basically uh, that luminal reacts with hydrogen peroxide to release a blue light. So the amount of light released by the reaction is actually basically is low unless a small amount of suitable catalyst is added into the reaction. So typically the catalyst is a small amount of iron or copper. So the reaction is has shown below of the formula. So, okay. So it's quite a deep topic, but I can try to explain a bit. So in the formula, it shows that the luminol will react with hydrogen peroxide and it forms an unstable intermediate. So as we all know, when an, as we all know, when an unstable intermediate compound is present, it will tend to become more stable. So it will start to decay, decay and become a smaller compound. So when the when it decays, it will decay until a ground state di and ion, which shows in the uh, which shows in the product of the reaction. And eventually it will also produce a light which is a blue light for the case of luminol. Okay, so we have uh, if in the luminal reaction, actually besides blue lights, we can also produce green lights as shown at, in the first image and then the second one is purple and the third one is pink. So how does it work? Actually, it's the same luminal reaction which requires the chemi uh, chem chemical compound which is luminol and hydrogen peroxide. So to in order to change the color of the glowing light, uh, you just need to apply some particular dye. So for example, in this uh, image that we obtained from a from an experiment experiment, it uses highlighters. So like if you wanted to produce a green light, so you just need added, uh, you just need to add some yellow highlighters into it. So it is because that the luminol is blue in color. So when it when it added with yellow highlighters liquid, so it will become green. So in order to have a purple one, you just add a purple highlighter and for the pink one you just add a pink highlighter. Okay. So now we're going to continue for the application of chemical luminescence in the uh, professionals world. Um so as you can see chemical luminescence um does have a proper usage. Um we I know that some of us do like glowing stick for like, concerts and stuff. But as you can see, the uh, chemicals uh, is used in the industry such as pharmaceutical industry. So what does it do? Uh, chemical is used 
to detect impurities in drugs. Um, so when it's like maybe like the factory made uh, medicines and then it's want to uh, sell it to others. Uh, before um, they sell it to others, they will use chemical medicines and then they check the medicines. Uh, either they are pure or have some impurities in it. So this helps the um, uh, user and the seller uh, like secure safety for both of them. Like if the seller sells something, uh, uh, an impure, impure medicines, the user might get harmed from it and then they get sued or something like that. So this is one of Camille uh usage. Okay, moving on to the next application, which is the most interesting part for me is the in forensic medicine. So as we all know, when we are watching the criminal or detective movies, we will be like uh, seeing the forensic doctors doing their work like uh, using the UV light to to observe whether there is blood stain at the crime scene, right? So okay, so chemical remissions occurs in that process. So how does it how does it work? So chemical remission is often used to check for presence of blood at the crime scene. So it is because that uh, the the crime will wipe out the blood and it may not be visible because they wash the area. So the scientists can use the luminal reaction to locate traces of blood that will not be detachable with our naked eyes. So the light emitted via the luminal reaction occurs when the blood catalyzes the oxidation of luminal when hydrogen peroxide is applied. So, and then we will show a video about forensic medicines. Shamir? Have you ever seen blood glow? No, this isn't science fiction. It's just some very cool chemistry. The reason why this is glow is because of a chemical called luminol. And luminol is a very powerful weapon in a forensic scientist's fight against crime. When luminol reacts with hydrogen peroxide, it produces energy in the form of light. But this reaction is so slow and you might not be able to see the light. That's where the iron in your blood comes into play. Because the iron in your blood speeds up this reaction and the result is a rapid release of brilliant blue light. This process is known as chemiluminescence, and it's how glow sticks, glow worms and fireflies all produce their light. But how does glowing help solve the brutal crime you might ask? Well, luminol is incredibly sensitive. It's used to detect blood even if it's been cleaned away. There's still enough of a trace of the iron in your blood remaining on the object to reveal the hidden clue. Even if the stain is used or even death is gold. So if detectives suspect that the crime scene has been tampered with, they spray the area with luminol and wait for the clue to reveal themselves which may just be enough to Okay, just a short summary for the video just now. Okay, so like the video just mentioned, uh, uh, sorry, like what we formula, what does the previous formula that we mentioned that the luminal reaction needs iron to as a catalyst for the reaction. So. In a typical luminal reaction without using catalyst, uh, actually the process of luminal reaction is quite slow. So it means that it emits light in a very small amount that it is hard to observe by us. So, but in the crime scene, as we all know in our biology knowledge, for our blood we have hemoglobins, right? In our hemoglobins, we con and the hemoglobins contains iron. So the blood, the iron in the blood act as a catalyst for the luminal reaction. So that is why that why crime scenes uses, why forensic medicine uses luminol to detect blood stain and to observe crime scenes. This is because when they found something suspicious or suspicious area in the crime scene, they were just starting to apply luminol and hydrogen peroxide and wait it to react. So when they closed the lights and using started to using UV lights to observe, 
you will find that if there is blood stain at the area, you will find a, a very glow, a very ob uh, obvious glowing of light. So it means that there are blood or even uh, fingerprints at the area. Okay. So the last application of chemiluminescence that we will explain is the application of chemiluminescence in cancer. Um, so in the older days, um, the, when you come to the doctor, you came to the doctor, then you, uh, and then the doctor say, oh, ma'am, sorry, you have cancer. Uh, what cancer, maybe like lung cancer. And then like, and then like the doctor want to uh, ask you to do treatment. But the problem is the, doc the doctor doesn't know the location, the specific location for your uh, cancer cells. So communications um, helps the doctors to know the exact location of your cancer cells uh, in order for you to uh, in order for you to receive the treatment. Maybe um, like the patient will swallow a pill if I'm not mistaken and then uh, after a few minutes the doctor will scan the patient's body and then they will see this glow from, from the monitor and then they will start the treatment because they know the exact location. Um, the thing about the laser treatment is it can kill cancer cells, but also the good cells, the cells that you need. So if they just like laser you uh, without knowing the exact location, you might die from it. So this is why chemiluminescence in cancer is such uh, one of the important usage uh, in chemiluminescence. Uh, for, your, for your information, uh, sorry, <laughs> for your information uh, about the oncology. Uh, oncology is a branch of medicine that deals with the prevention, diagnosis and treatment of cancer. Okay. Um, that's all from us. Um, I, I find the, this topic quite interesting. Uh, especially the forensic part. I hope you get inspired from what we share. Uh, and thank you and hope to see you soon. Okay, thank you. That's all from us. Okay, thank you, Ong and Shamim, for their great information sharing. So, um, I would like to invite the next group which is uh, from S13, not, not S13, S31T3. Okay, so let's invite Shah Azri and Shahril to the broadcast. Okay, Azri and Shahril, are you there? Yes, yes, Madam. Uh, all right, so. Okay. <laughs> bah. Uh, Assalamualaikum dan selamat sejahtera. Nama saya Azri dan ini Shahril. Uh, kami merupakan moderator untuk kelas SG1T3 dan kami akan berkongsi tentang Esther dengan video kami yang bertajuk uh, Mystery of Esther. Terimalah. Now I will present to you the mysterious book entitled The Mystery of Esther. One fine day, there is a boy named Azri who is studying chemistry at home alone. Suddenly, his best friend Charles came and gave him something. So yeah, Azri got excited and started unboxing the present. His chemistry lecturer told him last week about Esther. 
Gurus, takkan ada guna gurus. Wah, boleh mana? Do you guys know that most of this flavor is from Esther? But what is Esther? Azri is clueless, so he decided to search about Esther on Google, and there is one website that catch his attention. So let's take a look. What is Esther? Ester is a class of organic compound that are rare with water to produce alcohol and organic or inorganic acid. Ester derived from carboxylic acid are the most common. The term ester was introduced in the first half of the 19th century by German chemist Leopold Merlin. This is the equation that shows the formation of ester, in which carboxylic acid rare with alcohol to form ester and water. Ester have the general formula RCCO R prime, where R may be a hydrogen atom, an alkyl group, or an aryl group, and R prime may be an alkyl group or an aryl group, but not a hydrogen atom. If it were hydrogen atom, the compound would be a carboxylic acid. Oh, so they're seen a favorite from Ester, but how Ester is produced? How? Esterification. Esterification is a chemical reaction between carboxylic acid combined with an alcohol in the presence of a catalyst, commonly concentrated sulfuric acid, to form an ester. This, equa this equation shows that carboxylic acid will react with alcohol, undergo esterification to form an ester and water. So here is the simulation of the esterification experiment. A. To identify the carboxylic group present in an organic compound by Easter test. Step 1. Take one test tube. Step 2. Take 0.1 gram compound in the test tube. Step 3. Add 1 ml ethanol into the test tube. Step 4. Add 1 to 2 drops of concentrated sulfuric acid into the test tube. Step 5. Heat the reaction mixture for 10 to 15 minutes in a hot water bath at about 50 degrees centigrade. Step 6. Take 1 ether. Step 7. Pour 10 ml of aquascented carbonate solution into the beaker to neutralize excess sulfuric acid and excess carboxylic acid. Step 8. Pour 1 ml of the reaction mixture in the beaker. Step 9. Sweet smell of the substance formed indicates the presence of carboxyl function in the compound. So, it still can be made by esterification, but I wonder, this is lemon, this is rose, while well, this is plum. Is it only this three flavor, or is there any more? That's what I'll tell you. Example of flavor ester. Here is the example of flavor ester. The first one is methyl botanoid, which is apple. 
you can see here this is the equation of metal button white uh, just like the basic equation so you just can read and remember this equation next advantages of ester emollient ester can be extremely beneficial to skin they are emollients meaning they hydrate soften and smooth the surface of skin Lotion and cream intended to improve the texture of skin really on emollients as their active ingredients. Unlike other types of emollients, ester don't leave an oily residue on the skin, which gives them a special advantage. Solvent Ester can also function as a solvent. Solvent dissolve ingredients so they can mix together and work properly. Many personal care products including powders, lotion and shaving cream contain solvent to achieve to, ach to achieve the proper cons consistency. Next, thickening agent. Ester also function as thickening agent in cosmetics. Thickness and H enhance the consistency, viscosity and volume of lotion cream, conditioner, and other personal care products. Surfactant As discussed above, surfactant allow liquid, surfactant allow liquid that will otherwise remain separate from one another to make and remain in suspension. Many personal care products contain both lipids and water. So, these products need an Emulsifier to stabilize the mixture. Fragrance Ester are popular among perfumers and personal care product manufacturers for their naturally pleasant scent. For example, propyl ethanoids smell like fresh pears, pentyl nonoids smell like rose, and propyl octanoids smell like coconut. Next is the application of ester. Ester is widely used in the production of perfume. Perfume is a mixture of fragrant essential oils or aroma compounds, fruit and solvent, usually in liquid form used to give the human body, animals, food object and living spaces an agreeable scent. These are the benefits of perfume. Firstly, fragrance. While this one is quite obvious, perfume has been historically used primarily for fragrance. It helps keep unwanted body odor at bay and ensures that you smell good throughout the day. Secondly, it enhances your mood. Perfume helps lift your spirits. Whether you feel playful, mischievous, timid or even reserved, perfumes offer many different kinds of smells or different moods. Select and wear a perfume as per the occasion so that you can get in the app mood for it. Thirdly, it boosts your confidence. A good perfume can boost your confidence without feeling conscious of body odor. Choose a scent that suits your personality and which you can boost your morale to fight against all odds. Next, it's also aromatherapy. Citrus fruit floral and winter spice perfume help calm the mind and soothe the body. These perfumes ensure your stress level are in control. The last one, treat insomnia. Help you sleep better at night. Perf perfume which contain essential oil can help you relax and enjoy a peaceful slumber at night. But actually, there are more applications of ester in our real life, not just in the production of perfume. So yeah, Let's take a look. First and foremost, there is Esther in the production of lipstick. Secondly is in the production of paint. Thirdly, in our daily routine, 
face wash with herbal repair and salicylic actives. It fights up to 99.9% pimple causing germs and gives you pimple free clear skin every time. Stay germ free, stay pimple free. Last but not least, in the production of soap or body shampoo. White florals and black orchids. Soaps for 39 pesos. Now, the mystery is solved. Hazri is happy because finally he knows what Esther really is. He made a meeting with his gang planning for something. And as the mastermind has really them to the end unknown place. But the story will be continued in the next chapter. Okay, so congratulations S three one T three for their um, mysterious uh, presentation. So actually, they want to explain about the Esther, and we go to the last presentation. So we have another one more presenter, which is from S one three T twelve. So let's invite Henry into the broadcast. Okay, Henry, are you there? Yeah. Yes. Yes, madam. All uh, oh, right. Okay. 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 Can I start now? Uh, yes, you can start now. Okay. okay. Good morning to Madam Azia and my fellow friends. Okay, first of all, I would like to welcome all you all to this Kami Virtual Festival. In this occasion, I would like to have a present on the project of S one three P twelve for this virtual festival. Before it start, I would like to I would like to introduce myself. I'm Harry from S13P12. I'm so honored uh, that I given such an opportunity to learn online. So in our video, first we will be presenting the interesting short story about uh, organic compound, then followed by the slideshows about the organic compounds. And we have some Easter egg at the behind of the video, so please stay tuned. Lastly, I would like to remind you all to lower down the volume as we face some technical issues while edit the audio of the video uh, while the last minute, last three minutes. Oh, so this is our greatest apologize from S13 Peter. So hope you guys enjoy the video. Thank you. My name is Adi. My name is Henry. My name is Virus. My name is Chong. My name is Yura. My name is Sue. My name is Nazira. My name is Patin. My name is Alia. And we are from s one tp 12 This is our virtual chemistry festival project. So, hope you guys enjoy! Fully saturated hydrocarbon. I am Alken. <laughs> Hi, I'm Akin. I, at room temperature, I exist as three phases, which is gas, solid, and liquid. Hi, I have delocalized electron. My name is Aromatic. Okay. I'm colorless, in liquid or solid at room temperature. I'm an alcohol. <laughs> Hi, I'm carboxylic acid. I can be found everywhere in nature. I am a polymer. I am very light in weight, but I have significant degree of strength. Carbon carbon Singapore. 
Mm, excuse me. Hmm? I think I am the strongest one because I am unsaturated hydrocarbon formed by double or triple carbon bonding. <gasps> me la! No, me. It's me! It's me! It's, it's me! me. It's, it's me! It's me! me. It's me! me. It's me. It's me. It's me. I'm the strongest one, okay? Really? Yes! This is because I have alternating double bond in my ring which allowed me to share valence electrons. Uh, excuse me, I'm carboxylic acid and I think I'm the strongest one because based on my research, uh, I can be found everywhere in nature. This is because my fatty acids are glyceride, which is fat. For example, protein made from amino acid also contain carboxyl group. Sour. Mm. Um, have you done your part? Do you? Yeah. Mm, I think it's my turn. Do you guys know who I am? Who are you? Who are you? I am an alcohol. I may be classified as primary, secondary, or tertiary according to which carbon of the alkyl group is bonded to the hydroxyl group. I have low molecular weight and I'm highly soluble in water. Okay, enough, huh? Let me tell you all the truth. Okay. Hey, pay attention, pay attention to me. My name is Polymer. Okay. I'm very light in weight, but then I'm very strong. I have limitless range of colors and characteristics. Uh -huh. I can also make items that none of you can make. Really? really? Yeah, so it's true. Oh I'm the strongest. Mm. Huh? Excuse me, Polymer. Yeah. Aromatic is the strongest. No, no. Aromatic no. is the strongest. Guys, guys, enough. I think we all have our own importance and specialities. And we are stronger together. And that's how we build our chemistry. Hi, very good morning. Today, kita hari first shoot uh, first cam. 3, 2, 1. Fun. Hi, Allah Akbar. Hi, Allah Akbar. Hi, Allah Akbar. Hi, Allah Akbar. Hi, My name is Adi. Kejap, my name is Adi. Apa? Apa tak? Sorry, sorry. Okay, last, last. Okay, one. Aku tekan dah. Satu, dua, tiga. Hi. Hi! My name is Adi. My name is Harry. My name is Virus. My name, My name is Nazira. Oh, tak tahu tak. Fully saturated hydrocarbon. Cepat lah. So, you dari sini, you jalan, then you tengok kamera. Fully saturated hydrocarbon. My name is Alken. Bye bye. I'm carbosylic acid. I can be found everywhere in nature. Jaja, sorry, motor ni. Jaja, jaja, yeah, jaja, jaja. yeah belakang sikit. belakang sikit. Hi, 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 Hi,
done this, who is the strongest among us? Do you guys think? Who do you guys think? Eh, macam mana? Don't go scream dulu lah. Okay, okay. Have you ever wondered which is who is who? Okay, okay. Hello, hello. Hi, 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 hello. Okay, cut, 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 cut. Hey guys, have you ever wondered who is among us is the strongest one? Who is the strongest one among us? Among us, who is the strongest one? Okay, three, two, one, try, action. Oh, we need to feel like we love you. I think it's me because I have the strongest carbon carbon single one. Okay, uh, okay, tapi. I may be classified as primary, secondary, or tertiary according to which carbon of the alkyl group is bonded to the hydroxyl. Group. Kawi aku siapa yang cakap hidroksi? Hidroksi. Panjat sangat kan ni. Kek lah yang belakang tu. Panjat kek yang belakang. Hello. But I think it's me. Because I am unsaturated hydrocarbon. Mesti tak sedih. Tak apa. Lagi okey daripada cek itu dia. Okey okey. Mood kau lain masuk dia. Tak apa. Among us is the strongest one. I think it's me. Because I have the strongest cover-cover single bomb. Masa ni korang yang belakang buat muka macam benda dia ni Okay The strongest among us I think it's me because I have the strongest cover-cover single bond Okay Cik Iyah apa kata dia buat macam ni? Do you guys turn your part? Do you? Move away Kerja macam lambat sangat Okay je Oh lambat sangat Tiba-tiba Tiba-tiba ni Belakang buat apa? Datang lah, Nan datang kat dia Me, 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 me Haa, macam tu I'm the strongest one Really? Haa, lepas really lah baru cut Okay, Henry Hi, this is the end of the video So, thank you for watching our video Bye Okay, so thank you Henry. So we already run, uh, sorry, all of the, of the group already present their project. So congratulations to all. I hope this will become a memorable experience to you all. And see you, um, sorry, see you next. All right, so that's all. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.